Okay, so yesterday I finished arc four of Worm. So at least in terms of arc count, I'm ish-ish an eighth of the way through, which is decent progress. Like I And I'm glad I'm making progress, and I'm glad I am still enjoying the work. So this arc starts in school with Emma talking to Taylor and trying to bully her and trying to get under her skin. But since Taylor just came off of a fucking bank heist and fighting a bunch of superheroes and giving them the business and getting out of it, not unscathed, but getting out of it successfully, it's just not working. Emma's like, yo, I noticed you weren't at school and blah, blah, blah. Oh, you know, Emma, you better be careful. Otherwise, I might think you actually cared about me. And Emma's reaction being, the only reason I notice is because every time I look at you, I'm reminded of all the time I wasted being your friend. And again, I'm hearing this and I'm like, there's, there's so much bitterness in there. I really don't think it's just, man, why was I friends with this person? This person's boring. This person's unpopular. I still... There's something there that I'm not being told yet. And like I've said, I don't know if it's something that Taylor is ignorant of or if Taylor is specifically choosing to omit. And I do think that's kind of interesting. And again, I could be completely wrong. It could be that, no, Emma is just 1000% that bitch and she's an awful person. Or, yeah, there there is something more interesting here. It might not make her completely sympathetic with all the shit she is doing to Taylor. I don't think there is something that can make her completely sympathetic. But, given the themes of Worm and the moral grayness that the story oftentimes presents, and from what I understand, we get a lot more of that as it goes on, I don't think Emma's bullying of Taylor is going to be completely black and white by the end of the story, and I am looking forward to seeing how that goes. Excuse me. Aside from that, though, nothing really happened at school. Taylor, I think she audibly just says, Fuck you, Emma, and then she leaves. And, you know, that was pretty satisfying to hear. After that, she meets up with Brian, Lisa, and Alec. They can't meet up with Rachel because everyone knows who Rachel is outside of the mask. Like, if people see us hanging out with her, it gives away our cover. They hang out at the market. They go shop. Uh, Taylor goes clothing shopping with Lisa. It was like, cool. So, here is my offer. If you ever need me or anyone else in the crew to intervene in your personal life, just let us know. Lisa, I appreciate it. I appreciate the interest. I appreciate the offer. If you ever get involved in my personal life without my consent, I am immediately leaving. <laughs> Fair enough. Just wanted that said. It's my treat. I will buy all your nice new clothes. And going shopping and trying to get some new outfits for her, trying to, you know, instill some confidence in Taylor. And I liked that. I appreciated that. Then they, ah, sorry, really scratchy ear, itchy ear. They go to Fugly Bob's, which is a great name for a fucking greasy hole-in-the-wall restaurant. I loved that. Get something to eat, and Taylor's like, hey, can, can we swap origin stories? Which gives us a little bit of lore. Not just an origin story, which we'll talk about in a second, but really confirming the way powers work. Powers do require a triggering event. I believe the way they said it is, it activates your flight or fight, flight or fight response, and then goes even further beyond that. And it's like an event so huge and so traumatizing, you get powers as a result of it. I thought it was that the powers, excuse me, were specifically related to the triggering event. After hearing Gru's backstory. I'm no longer sure that's the case. Even Taylor's, it's... I can kind of see the connection with Taylor. It is there. But I'm not as sure anymore. They also mention that a second generation cape... So, or, you know, regardless if it's a superhero or a supervillain. Like, if you have a parent that has a power, you are not born with an ability. You still need a triggering event. However, 
it doesn't need to be nearly as traumatic or impactful. They specifically mentioned Glory Girl as a second generation cape. Her power was she took a hard foul, I think they said in volleyball, which made me go, are there fouls in volleyball? Like, it's not a contact sport, it's this side and this side, and the people on your own side are your teammates, they're not going to foul you. How do you foul somebody in volleyball? Like, is it just like if you spike the ball and hit someone in the face? Like, it's, I genuinely don't know, because I think they said volleyball, maybe they had said basketball and I misheard it, because I'm like, no, yeah, you can definitely hard foul somebody in basketball or football, whether you mean that as American football or soccer or rugby or, well, lacrosse. Like, I don't think I've ever seen lacrosse played aside from a tiny little bit at the end of Mean Girls and the lacrosse arc in Muv Love. I don't remember how much of a contact sport it is. I think there's a little bit, but anyways, point. Even a second generation cape needs a triggering event. So uh, I believe as Alec put it, Taylor, by asking us for our origin stories, you are asking us to relive some of the most traumatic personal days of our lives. No offense, don't want to share it. Fair enough. Taylor shares hers anyways. She, after months of bullying, which suddenly stopped, comes back from Christmas break, opens her locker, and it is full of crap. I think she specifically said it was full of used tampons. There might have been other stuff in there too, but that's the thing I really remember. She was then shoved into the locker, locked, or she threw up, then was shoved into the locker, locked into the locker, and no one got her out for several hours. And as she's in there, with all, like, in the dark, all this disgusting shit, there are bugs that are in there, and just the smell... That is what triggers her, and she that said that she became a lot more aware of the bugs that were in there. What I thought it was, it was something like, you know, getting pushed in a locker, like a port a like something, like in an enclosed space filled with bugs. I thought the bugs were a bigger factor in the event, and that's where the power came from. It seems I'm mistaken a little bit, but there's at least a little bit of a connection with her friends being, okay, are you sure you don't want us to do anything about it? Yes. Okay. Why haven't you done anything about it? I mean, it could be traced. Yeah, but you're smart enough to not let that happen. Why? <sighs> because I don't trust myself, because I don't think revenge is worth it. Well, if revenge isn't worth it, why do you want to be a supervillain? escape okay sure fine makes sense to us then brian shares his which was parents got divorced i think it was i lived with my dad my sister lived with my mom and my sister and i were always very close and then i noticed the way she started talking to me changed. she became a lot more reserved she was a bit more awkward then one day she sends me a text just help me so I dropped everything and ran. My mom's boyfriend hurt my sister. So I beat him within an inch of his fucking life. And that's when my powers manifested. I'm like, oh. So it's not, it wasn't like you were trapped in darkness or like uh, you were drowning. And so that's why it feels like you're underwater or sensory deprivation. He's even, he even says, he's like, for me, it wasn't like... A fight or flight response. I was just so angry and so desperately needed to protect someone I cared about, to avenge someone I cared about, that I acted. And then I noticed like the cuts in my hands from beating his face and there was darkness leaking out and so I had powers. And the reason I am a villain, the reason I do what I do, is I want to get the paternal rights from my parents so I can look after my sister. So I need money, and I need a place so I can take over for her. My dad is totally cool with it. My mom has said she is going to fight me on it. So I also need to make sure I have the resources to fight her through the courts so I can keep my little sister. I think that's really interesting shit. You don't hear Lisa's. You don't hear Alex. You don't hear Rachel's. I feel like I have enough context clues for Rachel 
if she was in a foster home, she was being abused. Or maybe she saw someone else being abused, but I think she was being abused and her power activated and it got somebody killed. Because that was something that was mentioned. I remember if that was arc three or in arc four is she used her power to kill somebody without her understanding how her power worked yet. So like it's was maybe more of an accident. From what I remember, that's pretty much the undersider plot before we move into the climax, because the climax is really fucking long. Yeah, that's basically it. So the climax is, we're going to go to the warehouse where the money is, make sure the money is all there. The money is in there. No one can find Rachel, so like, fuck, fuck, Rachel stole the money, that bitch, no pun intended, but that bitch, we're going to do something about it. And then they realize Rachel did not take the money and leave. It was these two doofuses. It was Uber and I think Leap. Again, I was listening to it, not reading it. So I don't know if it was Leap with a P, with a K, or something else. They are two streamers who will record their supervillain deeds and throw it up on the internet. It seems that there are people who genuinely enjoy them and people who will like, hate watch them because they think they're so stupid and cringy. They are video game themed villains who, this is like, yeah, like at one point they dressed, one was Mario, one was Bowser. They were doing like a, like arson, I think, or some shit. I was like, fuck, fuck, that's kind of funny. And for this, they're using a lot of bombs and explosives. So their theme is Bomberman. I believe it was Uber's ability is he can learn and master anything. And the leap's ability as a tinkerer is he can make something, anything, one time. Then if he tries to make it again, something is going to go wrong. Which actually I think is kind of an interesting ability. I, If there's one thing I love about Hunter x Hunter, I love how creative the powers are. But I love the limitations. And it's generally the limitation is what makes an ability stronger. And here... I can make anything at all, but the caveat is I can only do it once. It is not like if that item is really useful, I can't replicate it. That is pretty interesting. I think that's kind of neat. But so they fight them for a while. Just kind of beat their asses. Then the backup shows up also with a bomber band theme. It's Bakuda. You can reference earlier, this is a member of the ABB, and she is now the head bitch in charge of the ABB. And as Bakuda says, she's like, hi, nice to meet you. I know that you're the ones that put Lung in the birdcage. Armsmaster got the credit. You're the ones that did it. And if I am now taking over the organization, I, I can't just let something like that slide. And it looks really good for me if early on into my tenure as leader, I take care of y'all. So no hard feelings, but get absolutely fucked. So they're running from all kinds of bombs. There's like a frost bomb. There's like a time distillation bomb. There's a black hole bomb. And they're just getting blasted. They're, they're getting fucked. And after all the explosions are going off and they're running, they are led, I believe it is to more of like an open area where they're just surrounded by people with guns. And they realize we have been herded into this one spot. Where Bakuda has her goons and then just other people that she put bombs into to, oh, hi, Muhammad. Put bombs into to force compliance. And she gives a gun to this one. I believe said it was a, like a Korean like high schooler or so. I want you to shoot one of them. You don't have to kill them. Oh, also, like, she has this mask. And, again, I'm listening to the audiobook. They do the, like, they actually, like, do some voice, um, like, some voice changing for the mask to emulate what her mask does. And I think it's really cool. It's really hard to understand some of her dialogue, though, unfortunately. But she's like, hey, 
shoot one of them. You don't have to kill them, but I want you to shoot them, make a point, and the kid doesn't do it. Are you sure you don't want to do it? I, I can't do it. Oh, okay. So the bomb inside of him goes off and fucking liquefies him, and she's like, Oh, I forgot about that one! Oh, that one's so cool! And Alex like, fuck. That was kind of cool. <laughs> like, that's fucked up. You're an awful person, but like... Damn. I, it's not something I see every day, even in my line of where I, I have to give respect for where, where, it's, where it's due. But they end up kind of getting out of there, and then Bakuda starts chasing them on a fucking car. I don't know if they specifically... I, I, I feel like it was a big military vehicle. Like, it wasn't a tank, but I think they had mentioned it was like a bigger car. Gru, and I think Gru is like, guys, go. Like, I'll kind of hold them off for a bit. Alec, whose power is rebounded from using it too much and is in considerable pain, uses his power again to jerk with the person driving the car. So the car crashes, and Bakuda lands, but then she gets up and fires a fucking grenade launcher. Excuse me, Tattletale Tales... Tattletale Tales... The rest of the Undersiders. The way her bombs go off. She doesn't just have a thought. She doesn't snap her fingers. It's a toe ring. Like when she crosses that ring. It sends like signals and shit. Like to her mask and blah 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 blah. And it makes the bomb go off. So Taylor. Who is bleeding. Concussed. Exhausted. Gets her knife and fucking Taps it through pocket. I think they specifically say like these hot pink boots and cuts off her fucking like a couple of her fucking toes so she can't use her bobs anymore. And after that, she tosses the knife to Gru and passes out. Then she wakes up in like a back alley doctor. And there's her bug, because like the last thing she had done with her bugs was she wanted them to swarm around her. And when she was unconscious, the order was still going. I don't know how important that is. But that like it's on the one hand, it's like, oh, that's a nice little bit of war and power shit. Unless she stops a command, it's going to keep going, even if she's not consciously giving it anymore, even if she is unconscious. But I wonder if there's going to be a point in the story where it's like, no, it's very, very important that you remember she can do that. She wakes up a little bit. Dispels the bugs, falls back asleep, wakes up again at home with her dad, and Lisa and Brian are there, and they meet her dad, they talk to him for a bit, everyone seems to be chilling, and Taylor's like, oh, fuck, oh, fuck, oh, fuck, oh, fuck, oh, fuck. Guys, I mean no offense by this. I love y'all. I kind of hate that you're here, because I don't want these two aspects, I want to keep the cape part of my life and the tailor part of my life as separate as possible. Like, we get it. We understand. We're sorry for invading. We had to get you home and we had to make sure your dad knew you were okay. Are you mad? I'm not mad. Thank you. But, uh, that's basically the ending of the book. It's Oh, no, and then they, she also learns that Lung escaped. That Bakuda wasn't just fucking with them. Bombs were going off everywhere, and Lung was able to escape, so he is now back with the ABB, and he is back to being the head bitch in charge. That's where the book ends. And we get our two interludes. <clears throat> Excuse me. The first was a cape named Caden. I don't think we actually heard her superhero name, or her supervillain name, as we find out near the end of it who is trying to clean up the city, specifically the ABB, and she is a former member of Empire 88, which is the neo-Nazi villain team. And she wanted to get some members back to help her clear out the ABB, but the leader of Empire 88, I think his name was, it was Matt or Max, I'm gonna say it was Max, said, I'm not gonna give you any more of my people, Unless you join me again, because they worked together for a long time, they were married, and now they're divorced, and they have two kids. Like, if look, if you want to come back, 
then I'll give you everything you want. You still have to answer to me, you have to report to me, but I'll make you a deal. If you work with me again for a year and you still don't like my methods, then it's all yours. You are in charge of Empire 88. You are in charge of the business, both legitimate and otherwise. No strings attached, no bullshit, deal. I feel like I'm selling my soul to the devil, but deal. The second interlude is a Rachel chapter because she was not in this part and it's not from her perspective. It's from the perspective of her dog, Brutus. And Brutus is a good boy, <laughs> which is it's just frequently said. Like, Brutus does this. Brutus loves Master. And Brutus is a good boy. And like, I, I love this. <laughs> it's like, I'm not even a dog person. I think this is fucking adorable. And it's Rachel taking Brutus to a dog fighting ring to fuck up and shut down the dog fighting ring. Possibly she adopted a dog or two from there and we'll see you later. I'm not as sure about that. But she shut that shit down. Also, a kid walked up and was like poking Brutus. And Rachel had Brutus nearly tear the kid's arm off to teach the kid and the kid's mom a lesson. Because Rachel is a menace and a problem. Like, I get it. Also, what the fuck? They also mentioned that when she was taken captive by the Bomberman duo, they, uh, what was it? They tied her to the ceiling by her wrists and used her as a punching bag. You're like, uh, points for creativity. That is super fucked up, though. And they mentioned that, uh, from Brutus's perspective, Master is his alpha, but her alpha is Gru. And I thought that was just kind of neat. That was the end of arc four. I don't think I liked it quite as much as arc three. Because what I loved about arc three was all of the... Like, I love a heist. So, talking about the heist, planning the heist. These are the people with powers we need to watch out for. Then fighting those people with powers. And then other shit happens. Like when Glory Girl and Panacea show up. And then I love the interlude of the wards having to decompress. There's the bureaucracy aspect. There's the PR aspect. And then there's the, what can we learn from these fights? The actual cape aspect. And then a little bit of Panacea's character. Like, she's super fucking interesting. I can't wait to see more of this. Arc 4 is a real, it's a cool climax. But it's, Almost kind of all it is. I mean, I I feel like I can almost maybe say that about part three. Because that's what a lot of part three felt like as well. I don't know. It's, it's not like, oh man, this was bad. This was terrible. Not at all. I still enjoyed it. I still had a good time with it. I don't think I quite liked it as much as part three. We'll see with part five. Maybe it's better. Maybe it's a little worse. Maybe it's about the same. I might start it later today, I might not start it till tomorrow, but there's a non-zero chance I'll finish part five by the end of the year. 